Good morning. This is Sunday morning, and um, we're going to be doing our service this morning online. Very different for us. However, when the government says you need to stay home, then we stay home. And so we have this wonderful thing called technology and the internet, and um, we're just going to make full use of that. And uh, just as we would go to church and worship in a building, uh, gathering together as a congregation, his church, uh, we're going to do that same thing here uh, through the internet, me at my house, you at yours, and yet, even though it's not what we would call traditional worship, it's still worship. Uh, worship isn't um, what we uh, do in a building, but worship is our response to God and what he's done for us. And so our typical worship, as we know, would be the fact that we go to church, we open his word, and we're taught from it. Then we uh, take opportunity to pray. We tithe and worship. Then we again open his word and we worship him through the study of his word. And so this morning we're going to do several of those aspects together. We're not going to have the opportunity to sing together formally because if you've heard me sing, you know that it's terrible. And yet, as you and your family sit there uh, and you take the time to go through and listen to this sermon, you can also take the opportunity to raise your voices to God in worship. And so I'm going to be very dedicated in the fact that you're going to see me set my stopwatch. That doesn't really mean much, but I'm going to be quite committed to keeping this under, we'll say, like 40 minutes. At first you think that's a lot, and yet it really isn't when we think about the fact that we do set an hour aside for a Sunday morning service. And so... Without further ado, we're just going to open up with a word of prayer. Uh, Fathers, we come in your presence this morning. We thank and praise you for the many things that you blessed us with. Lord, we uh, thank you for knowing that no matter where we are, Lord, uh, scattered throughout the community, um, the scripture says there are two or more gathered together in my name. I'm there in the midst. And so, Father, we know that as we come to you in prayer this morning and as we open your word and we worship you, we know that you're here with us. So, Father, we just pause in your presence right now. We pray that we could just put the business of the world far from us just for a little uh, period of time, Lord. We think of um, the fact that, or the reason that we're meeting like this, Lord, is the, that there's a lot of sick people out there. And so, Lord, we just pray that, uh, number one, you'd have your hand upon each one of us, that um, you would allow us to be healthy, Lord, not because um, we're good and wonderful people, but because we're your children. And Lord, we pray that in our health, we would be able to minister to the people around us and to point them towards you. Lord, we um, think of the passages of Scripture that says if your brother has a need, and um, we say, oh, here, um, be fed, be clothed, and go away. And yet we don't help meet their needs, Lord. We've done nothing for them. And so, Father, we pray that in our health, we would be able to reach in the lives of the sick, Lord, that we would be able to uh, meet physical needs, possibly helping nurse them back to help, health, uh, maybe going to the grocery store and getting them groceries. But, Lord, whatever it would be, we pray that um, our health would be used as a tool to point others toward you. Uh, Lord, in this time of sickness, this virus that's going around, we think of our economy and how it's pretty much come to a standstill. And, Lord, is people in the United States of America, even though we're children of God and we know you as our personal Savior and we depend on you for um, everything that we have, for the food that we eat, the house that we live in, the cars that we drive, we depend upon you for that, Lord, and yet oftentimes we take that for granted. And so as we think about our economy, Lord, we pray that, um, it, that the effects of that wouldn't be lasting, Lord, that this um, virus, this sickness would go away quickly, Lord, that those that aren't working would be able to get back to work. And yet, Lord, we also know that you remind us in Matthew that um, our every need is taken care of. You you mentioned the fact that if you clothe the lilies of the valley and take care of the sparrows, uh, how much more important are we than them? And so, Lord, we just uh, think of the fact that even though the economy is bad, we know that you'll take care of us. We think of our president, Lord, and all that he's going through right now. Lord, we don't know if he knows you as his personal savior, but we just pray that it might be this that 
draws him to you, Lord. As we think about Solomon when he was ready to become king. He said, Lord, I'm but, but a child, and how can I uh, run a nation? And so, Lord, I think our president is needing the same thing that Solomon needed, and that would be wisdom. So, Lord, we pray that you would give him wisdom as he runs this country, as he uh, works through this virus situation and how best to try to contain it. Yet, Lord, we know that without your help and your strength, this will never happen. And, Lord, we uh, think this morning of the church. When we talk about the church, we first think of our building in Honesdale. And yet, Lord, we think about the church universal, your children throughout this world. We pray that you would have your hand upon them, Lord, that you would make them strong, that through this adversity, this time of trial, that they would shine, that they would point others towards you. We think of uh, China and Italy and Iran and throughout the world of people, children of God that are fighting this virus. We pray, Lord, that in their time of hardship, they would be able to point others towards you. Lord, as we read scripture, we see when Paul pointed others towards you in his greatest times of hardship in prison, when he was beaten, uh, when he was left for dead. And yet, Lord, we also have that same opportunity. So we pray that as a church, we would shine you. Lord, we thank the missionaries throughout the world that are on the forefront of this battle also, away from home. Uh, and yet, we know that you can use them also, that this would be a tool in their mission field. Lord, as we <clears throat> walk through life, we think of our spiritual walk with you. Father, you give us the opportunity to call you Abba Father, Daddy. And Lord, we pray that in this time it would draw us close to you, that we wouldn't just sit glued to the TV watching the news and uh, dwelling upon all the bad that's happening as we listen to the news, but we would dwell upon how good you really are to us, Lord, how you gave us your Son, Jesus Christ, to... Scripture says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we know that um, we had a need, and because you loved us so much, you died on the cross for our sins. And, and so, Lord, that was the start of our walk with you. And yet, Lord, we need you daily. We need you daily to uh, know how to live in such a manner that it would point others towards you. How to live in such a manner that we could overcome sin. And yet we pause there as Scripture floods under our mind. It says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so, Father, we know that we can have a walk that's pleasing in your sight. Because you've given us every tool to accomplish that task. You've given us your Son, Jesus Christ. You've given us the Holy Spirit who resides inside of us. You've given us your Word. And so, with these tools together, Lord, we know that we can resist sin. But we pray that our Christian walk would be pleasing in your sight. That our Christian walk would point others towards you. And that, Lord, in our pointing others towards you with our actions, it would up, open up the opportunity to open our mouths and, as Scripture says, proclaim the mysteries of the gospel of peace. Lord, we just think of um, uh, the other opportunities that we do have, Lord, knowing that people are out of work, knowing that people are sick and tired. Lord, we just pray that um, it would be this opportunity, this virus that everybody fears, that could be used as a tool to cause the church to grow. When I say grow, Lord, I don't mean um, necessarily in numbers. I mean for each one of us to grow spiritually. But yes, also, Father, in growing spiritually, it would cause us to be obedient to you, to open our mouths and to share the gospel around us. Lord, we just pray that in our obedience that people would come to know you as our personal Savior. So, Father, we pray that you'd use this time in our lives, use this time in the period of this church history to see the church grow greatly, to see each one of us mature in you. And Father, we just thank and praise you for the fact that we can worship you by opening your word, even though we're uh, far apart, uh, meeting here and there, sitting on our couches or in our kitchen or wherever we could find an internet connection, Lord. But we just pray that our worship would be a sweet-smelling savor in your sight. So Father, we set this time aside to you. We pray that you would uh, speak to each one of us through the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, as I was getting ready to prepare for this, it, it really brought back a lot of thoughts that I've been having in youth group we've been going through First John. 
and First John has an overriding theme if you would read through just a few small chapters, and yet it speaks often about Christian love and how we're to love each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord, how we're to help meet needs. Uh, it says several times that um, if we say we love our brother and yet we're not living a life that's pleasing to you, then um, we're really hating them. And so as I thought about that, First uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and I'm just going to kind of turn there real quick, you know. <clears throat> First John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 say, And it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with our hands, and have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was the of the Father, was manifest unto us. That which we have heard, seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, there's certain things I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to talk about what the response of the church should be through this time of, um, we'll call it the pandemic, as everybody's been calling it, uh, the Covidian virus. But what is our response as the church? And as we saw in this verse, um, speaking to the Christians, it said, you've heard it. In other words, you've heard the word. You've heard Jesus speak. It goes on to say in verses 1 through 3 of 1 John chapter 1 that you've watched it. It goes on to say that you've handled the word of life. You've done it. And then number 4 it says you've proclaimed his word. And then it goes on to say that we have fellowship with each other. And so as we were going through 1 John in youth group, there's some very valuable tools which remind us what we're to be doing as children of God. Um, we're in God's Word. We should be. Uh, we've read it. We've handled it. Just as it said here to the, to the early church. But as the world watches us, we're their Bible, if you will. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 of 1 John um, has a couple more things to say. It says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Brother, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And uh, he tells us, I'm not giving you any new commandments in God's word. You have my word. And... Um, as we work our way through this pandemic, are you exhibiting what, what a child of God should be? Are you demonstrating to the unsaved how we should act? Or are we being controlled by fear and just wanting to take care of ourselves and not really worrying about anybody else? <clears throat> verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 11 says, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. First John is telling us that you're not being given any new commandments, but the message you've heard from the beginning is to love one another. And I'm going to pause there for a moment. As children of God, do we love one another? And really, what does that look like? Well, we could look at our family situations and we say we love our wives. If you're a husband or husband, you know, wives, you love your husbands. What does that look like? We say we love our children. Well, we instruct them, we teach them, we take care of their needs. As husbands, we protect our wives. In this verse 11 in chapter 3 says, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Do we love our families? Do we truly love our wife? Do we truly love our husband? Do we truly love our children? I'm going to progress that one step further. Scripture says that if uh, we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, then we're his children. From that I can extrapolate the fact that if I'm his child and somebody else is his child, 
that knows him as their personal savior, then we're family. Do I truly love the family of God? And so as we talk about this virus and things like that, um, what are we doing about it? Chapter 3, verse 18 says, My little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Are we helping the people around us that have needs? Maybe their physical needs, maybe their spiritual needs, but are we taking time to demonstrate his love? Um, verse eighteen, uh, verse seventeen says, "But whoso hath his, whoso hath this world's goods, and shut up, and seeth his brother who has need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him?" And so, as we look at verses 17 and 18 in First John chapter 3, uh, His love is demonstrated through us. His love is made perfect through us. But it goes on to say that we can have boldness. And so, I'm going to turn over to First John chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 17 and 18. And it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we might have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. And so, again, John, 1 John has an overlying theme throughout. We're coming right back to the fact that if we say we love him, and we're his children, are we demonstrating it? Verse 17 um, says, uh, His love is demonstrated through us. It also says that His love is made perfect through us. But then it goes on to say that we may have boldness. And that's a word that we tend to avoid. As a child of God, during this terrible time, where um, everybody's worried about this Covidian virus and things like that, do we have boldness? Um, it goes on to say in verse 18, verse 17, As he is, so are we in this world. Are we exhibiting the same characteristics and qualities that Jesus Christ did when he walked on this earth? Are we helping people? Yes, he did several things. He helped them in their physical difficulties. He taught the word, and he pointed others towards his Heavenly Father. Are we doing that? Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. As we watch the nightly news and, and the news throughout the day, it, it really is generated by fear. And... Uh, the fear of people dying. It's interesting because as we think about that, we do have fear of death, and yet Scripture tells me, because I know Him as my uh, personal Savior, that when I die, it says that I'll be absent in the flesh, but in His presence. And so I'll leave this earth and go into His presence. Does that really sound like something to be afraid of? And yet if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there is great fear. Because when you pass from this earth, uh, your destination is a place of eternal pain and punishment forever. And separation from God. And that's the fear that the world has. And so as we think about that this morning, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Am I demonstrating the perfect love of Jesus Christ by the way that I'm acting, by the way that I'm uh, reaching out into the world. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 say, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's the commandment that First John is referring to. 
do we love one another? It says, by this shall all men know. The world will know you're his disciple if we have love for each other. Love for each other, meaning the church, children of God. And so I'm going to pause here for a moment and just ask a couple pointed questions. Number one, are we checking on the people around us? Now, as we sit in church on a Sunday morning, there might be 75 or 80 people there. Are we in touch with them right now? Seeing if they have needs. Making sure that their health is good. Uh, those are things that demonstrate his love. Are we aware of each other's physical needs? Are we aware of each other's spiritual needs? Number three, are we praying for each other? It's interesting because in the time of crisis, or when somebody's going through something, we always say, well, well I'll pray for you. Or, or we'll say, you know, the least I could do is pray. Well, really, that's the best thing we can do, is to pause and pray. And so, are we doing that? Number four, use this opportunity to point others towards Jesus Christ. You see, we have what the world is looking for. If we know Christ is our personal Savior, we have that safety and security of knowing that we're His children. The world is looking for this. The question is, are we shining it? And then number five, uh, are we being bold to share the hope that we have? The hope that the world is looking for. Are we sharing the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins? As we would remember in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that's the hope that we should be boldly sharing with the unsaved people around us. Are we? And so let's use this time of being home with their families because we're restricted in our movements and things like that, um, are we taking the time to demonstrate who Jesus Christ is? Are we taking the time to point others towards him? And then finally, are we opening our mouths? It's interesting because I'm going to move into the second segment of what we're going to talk about this morning. And that would be, what should I do when the future looks bright, when the future looks bleak? And so, just ask yourself, Lord, how can you use me during this time? How can you use me to help calm the people around me, to point others towards you, and to help meet needs? And so, as a church, that's one of our goals, is to be a child of God that others would desire to be like. Now, as I move into the second part of my what we're going to share this morning, some of this I've taken from somebody else, but I have a little thing here. There was a monk who was joined a very strict monastery order. In fact, they were so strict that the monks had to take a vow of silence, which was only would be only broken every five years, and then only with two words. After his first five years, the monk went to see the abbot for his two-word interview. The abbot said, My son, you've been with us for five years now. What two words would you like to say? And the monk said, Bed hard. I see, said the abbot. You are excused. After five more years, the monk went again to see the abbot. The abbot asked the monk, So have you been with us? You've been with us for ten years now. What two words would you like to say? The monk answered, Food bad. He said, I see, said the abbot, you're excused. After five more years, this being 15 years into this thing, and all, uh, the man appeared before the abbot one more time. And again, the abbot asked, what two words would you like to say? And the monk replied, I quit. The abbot responded, well, I'm not surprised. All you've done since you've got here is complain. <laughs> and as I think about that, oftentimes, that's a picture of my life. It's sunny out, and rather than thank the Lord for the sun, I complain that it's too warm. Or we move into fall, and we can enjoy the beautiful leaves, and uh, all I can think about is the fact that winter's coming, and I complain about it. 
And then winter comes, and I complain that it's too cold. And, and I gripe about the cold and things like that, and along comes spring. And then I gripe about the fact that it's muddy out. I, I forget the fact that it's getting warmer, but I always look for things to complain about. And so, this morning, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that gives me direction on how I should act or what I should do when the future looks bleak. And I'm going to give you an outline, and then we're just going to move into our lesson this morning. But number one, I need to admit my, admit my fear when the future looks bleak. Number two, I need to focus on God when the future looks bleak. Number three, I need to make God the source of my joy when the future looks bleak. And number four, I need to seek strength from God when the future looks bleak. And so those are the things that we're going to look at this morning. And uh, we've already opened up in a word of prayer, but um, I love this technology. Normally you see me struggle with my iPad, and yet here I have this... Um, computer in front of me and I'm still struggling with that but um as I think about it what do I usually do when things look difficult uh, do I pray do I read my bible do I just go find a quiet place and hide do I talk to a close friend and share what I'm going through do I complain well as I read through scripture I know that I'm not alone I'm going to just give a couple names of people in the scripture that when they were going through difficult times, what did they do? Remember Adam and Eve? They lived in paradise. And when Eve was tempted and she sinned, it said she was deceived. And then Adam openly sinned. Um, what did they do? Now, the, typically in the evening, they walked with God. And yet, uh, in the cool evening, when God was calling for them, Adam and Eve realized they were naked, and they ran and hid themselves. So that's what they did when their future looked bleak. We move on a few years down the line, and the earth is getting really, really bad, and you have Noah. What did Noah do when the future looked bleak? Well, he was building a boat that God told him to build. And so for 120 years, he talked about what God was going to do. And yet he also talked about how God would save them if he would allow them to. And then we move along and we come to Abraham. Remember Abraham when his wife was taken prisoner and how he lied and said that she was his sister. And so he, he just kind of uh, sinned and, and that's how he dealt with it because he was afraid that he was going to be killed because his wife was beautiful. We move on down the line to when God talked to Moses. And God told Moses, I'm going to use you to take my people out of Egypt. And when Moses' future looked bleak, he, he after he killed that Egyptian soldier, he ran and hid in the backside of the desert. And, and then God came to him and said, Moses, I'm going to use you to tell Pharaoh to let my children go. And, and one of the first things Moses started doing is making excuses. And he said, God, I can't t t talk. And so he made excuses. And he just was deathly afraid of uh, doing what God said. And he thought his future was very bleak because he thought, Pharaoh's going to kill me. We move along in time and we have Jonathan and Saul's son. And uh, Jonathan and David were friends and they confided in each other when the future looked bleak. And speaking of David, what did David do when the future looked bleak? Well, David did a lot of things. Um, he, he ran and hid. Remember, he was in the back of the cave while Saul was there, and uh, he was hiding from David's presence, and, or from Saul's presence, and he was running. And When the future looked bleak for David, he, he lamented to God and prayed to God. And, and yet, he was running for his safety. Remember Jonah, when the future looked bleak? God said, Jonah, I want you to tell Nineveh what's going to happen to them. And I want you to proclaim to them. And Jonah ran and hid because the future looked bleak. 
because the people he was supposed to go talk to were enslaving uh, the Jewish people, and he didn't want to share with them. And so when the future looked bleak, Jonah also ran from the presence of God. I think about Peter in the Bible. Remember just before Jesus Christ was going, well, actually, let's back up a step before that. Remember when they were on the boat in the storm and Jesus was walking on the water and they, they were scared to death and they saw Jesus on the boat and they cried out in fear because they thought he was a ghost. And uh, Peter said, if it's you, bid me come. And Jesus said, come to me, Peter. And so Peter jumped up on the side of the boat and stepped into the water. And it says, and as he was walking, he noticed the storm around him. And he took his eyes off of Jesus. And as he was sinking, he cried out, Lord, save me. And it says, and Jesus um, saved him, reached out his hand. But let's go a little further down the line with Peter. Remember when they were in the garden praying, just before Jesus was taken captive and was going to be offered up as a sacrifice on a cross. And um, people would ask Peter, do you know him? And he would deny the fact that they knew Christ, that he knew Jesus, because he was afraid for his life. And so he denied Christ, lying, and saying, I didn't know him. And so when his future looked bleak, he also sinned. And then let's just look at one more person, the Apostle Paul. How did he respond when the future looked bleak? Well, you could read scripture that talks about all the things that he went through. He went through shipwreck. He went through beatings, whippings. He was left for dead. Uh, and yet, remember back when he was in the prison and at midnight after being beaten and thrown in stocks, it said he sang praises to God. And so, as I think about how these various people in the Bible responded when the future looks bleak. I have to ask myself a question. How am I responding when the future looks bleak? And as I look at the timer on this here, time escapes us very quickly. And so the passage of scripture we're going to look at this morning is in Habakkuk. And your first thought is, who? Habakkuk? We're going to be looking at uh, passage of scripture in Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 1 through 19 and so let me just give me a moment to get my iPad to that <clears throat> but let me give you a little backdrop on Habakkuk who Habakkuk was he was a prophet who prophesied about the invasion Judah's invasion by King Nebuchadnezzar remember this was the king that took Daniel captive and others in Babylon. Remember, there were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and others. And um, so he prophesied about this beforehand. But in his prophesying, he asked a couple questions, two to be specific. In, in um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, he asked the first question, and that was, why was God allowing increased evil in Judah to go unpunished. And you can see that in Habakkuk chapter uh, 1, verses 2 through 4, and it says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even to cry out of the violence which you will not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold my grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there that are raised up, strife and contentions. Therefore the law is lacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard the wonders marvelously. For I, work a, for I, wor I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though I told you. And so Habakkuk asked a question, God, why are you allowing all this evil to go unpunished? And so, he, he asked several things. Number one, I'm going to paraphrase this, paraphrase this, and it's, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you will not hear me? And uh, God said to Habakkuk, I'm going to do something in your days that you will not believe, even though you were told. And so, 
That's the first question he had. But as I look at the problem that Habakkuk had, uh, he was impatient. You know, he's saying, God, how long do I come to you in prayer, pointing this out to you, and you're not doing anything about it? And so Habakkuk wants God to stop the wickedness in Judah and is frustrated when God doesn't respond the way he thinks he should. And then question number two. After God tells him what's going to happen, he asks the question, how could God use the Babylonian people who are more wicked than the Jewish people to punish them? So you see, Habakkuk wants God to take care of the sin that's in Judah. And when God tells him what he's going to do, he's appalled with the fact that how could God use somebody more wicked than Judah to punish them? And the second question is asked in um, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. And we're going to read that real quick. And that would be 112. It says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and to hold their tongues when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he? And makest men as the fish in the sea, and as the creepy things which have no rule over them. They take up all of them with the angle they catch them in their nets, and they gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad." Therefore they sacrificed their necks, their nets, and burnt incense unto their drag, because by them their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their nets, and not spare continually to slay the nations? I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, what I shall answer when I am reproved. And so if I could... Uh, just kind of paraphrase that also. Um, God, I am raising up the Babylonians to judge Judah. And that's in verse 6. And Habakkuk asks the question, are you sure? That doesn't make sense. The problem is, Habakkuk is confused. When God confuses us, he asks us to trust him. And so... Uh, Habakkuk asks two questions, and God answers him. And um, what is Habakkuk's response to him, to God? And we could see that in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. And it says, first of all, uh, verse 1, it's a prayer from Habakkuk, the prophet. So that tells us the fact that he's a prophet. But verse 2 says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy works in the midst of the years, and in the midst of the years make known the wrath and remember mercy. And then in the verses that follow, God tells him what's going to happen to Judah, the, the Jewish people, and how they're going to be taken captivity. And it, it talks a little bit about how severe it's going to be and how terrifying they're going to be. And um, in verse 16, how did he react? To what God had to say. And we can see that in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 16. It says, When I heard my belly trembled, my lips, qu my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh upon the people, he will invade them with his troops. And so, Habakkuk is terrified. And so, I'm just going to move through this quite quickly because our time is running away. But, Back in chapter 3, verse 16, his response is, Number one, I'm afraid, but I'll wait patiently. Verse 18 says, I will rejoice. And so Habakkuk was learning to live by faith. If you went back to chapter 2, verse 14, or verse 4, it says, The righteous will live by his faith. And so the big picture here, when the future looks bleak, God asks us to trust him. How did Habakkuk respond to that? 
Verse 17 says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the pens, and the cattle in the stalls, it goes on to say, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And so, it's interesting because the people of Israel warned many years before that, that this would happen if they turned from the Lord. And we could see that in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 17 through 20. And it says, I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain by your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursue you. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make you your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield her f fruit. And so uh, God told Habakkuk what he was going to do. And he reminded him that that's what was said to him in Leviticus. And how did Habakkuk respond when his future looked bleak? Well, the first thing he did is uh, he needed to admit his fear. And we can see that in verse 16. It says, When I heard, my belly trembled and my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the Lord, he will invade them with his troops. And so I'm just going to break this verse down really quickly. It says, I felt sick to my stomach. When his future looked bleak and he was afraid, it said he felt sick to his stomach. He says, my voice quivered or shook. Basically, you know, it said rottenness entered his bones. Let me put it to you this way. He was scared to death. He physically was trembling. But then he goes on to say, but I will wait. Psalms 56 verses 3 and 4 say, in what time I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God I will praise his word. In God I will put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And as we think about these passages of scripture and we think about Habakkuk, he was just like me and you. Yes, he was a prophet. But he was no super saint. Um, he was just like us. Verse 16, um, he was filled with fear. As we talk about this virus and things like that, does it bring fear to you? As I watch the news, I can see the fear that it brings a lot of people. But as Habakkuk did, we need to admit our fears. Number two, how do I respond when the future looks bleak? I need to focus on God. Habakkuk, uh, verse 2 in chapter 3 says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy works in the midst of years. In the midst of years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. And so, let me put it to you this way. Habakkuk said, I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Amazing things happen when God is worshipped. People change. Perspectives change. God tells Habakkuk, I'm going to have Israel, Judah, taken captive. And yet, uh, people do change. Through that captivity, uh, the people of Judah, God's chosen people, change. And their perspective changes. In fact, as I look at my own life, our problems always seem huge and unsolvable when you look at them through our simple human eyes. Our human perspective, instead of looking at them through the light of God. So when I look at life without God, things look terrible. And yet when I look at them through God's presence, it's so much different. When we make God the focal point of our universe, our problems begin to take their proper perspective in relation to his greatness and his ability to handle them. Psalms chapter 73, verses 16 and 17 say, When I tried to understand all of this, it was too painful for me, to, for me until I entered into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. 
again, that's putting things in perspective. Lamentations 3, 19 through 26. And I know that's a large passage of scripture, but it's reminding us who God really is. It, it says, I remember my afflictions and my wandering. The bitterness and the gall, I remember them, and my soul was downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, therefore I have hope, because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed from his compa compassions, never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, therefore, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him. To the ones who seek him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of God. The same king who conquered Jerusalem, the one Habakkuk dreaded when he heard that God would use Babylon against Judah, would eventually concede to the greatness of God. And so, in Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, Nebuchadnezzar was the king that took Judah captive. And yet, it's going to this passage of scripture, it says, At the end of that time, Nebuchadnezzar raised up his eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is the eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation, and all people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? And so here you have Nebuchadnezzar, who even after... Um, him being prideful and, and losing his mind for a period of time comes back to the fact of conceding that nobody can stand in God's way. And so, number three, how should I, re should I respond when my future looks bleak? I need, need to make God the source of my joy when my future looks bleak. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 18 says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. And so even though Habakkuk's future looked very bleak, he said, uh, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk had every reason not to rejoice, yet he decided to rejoice in the circumstances. Yet he decided to rejoice, not in the circumstances, but in the Lord. His joy was a supernatural joy. Um, yet he could have been overcome by his situation, and yet he chose to have joy. Uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4, 11, 11 through 13, Rejoice in the Lord always. And that's in chapter 4, verse 4. It says, I will say again, rejoice. I have learned to be content with whatever circumstance. I know what I have. I know what is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so again, where is your source of joy? Number four, when my future looks bleak, I need to seek strength from God. Verse 19 says, The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like the hinds, uh, my feet, and he will make me walk upon the high places. That's an interesting verse because remember, previous to that in verse 16, it said that his legs shook and they were trembling. And yet, after he started to look at things through God's perspective, uh, he sought strength from God. Habakkuk says, um, my legs are strong and they'll take me up the mountain. And so, Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Isaiah 30.15 says, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. When life seems crazy, when things around you seem nuts, just pause and think about that. And quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Seek strength from God when your future looks bleak. 
Another large passage of scripture that we're going to just talk about briefly. I'm going to let you read it on your own. But Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 26 says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out the heavens with a spanning, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, and hath taught him? Who hath took him counsel? and has instructed him, and taught him in the paths of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him in the ways of understanding. Behold, the nations are a drop in the bucket, and are counted as small dust in the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very small thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for burnt offerings. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will they liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and cast a silver chain. And he that is impoverished, that he hath no oblation, chosen a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image, and they sh then shall not be moved. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath you not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretch out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. That bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown. Their stock shall not be taken shall not take root in the earth. He shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high. Behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their holy, bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them by name, by greatness of his might, for he is strong in power. I'm not going to talk about that passage of scripture long, but think about that for a minute. Um, he, he, God says, who, you know, I measured out the waters in my hand, and I measured heaven. Only God can do that. He, he says that I call the stars by name. He, he goes on to say that um, who taught me or who gave me counsel? And so I encourage you to look at that passage of Scripture when things look bleak. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 26. And so Psalms chapter 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. It seemed like we were very rushed in that passage of Scripture, but when the future looks bleak, as I listen to the news... They really make the future look bleak. They talk about the sickness. They talk about throughout the world how many people have died here, how many people have died from it, um, how many they, they expect to die. You know, they talk about how bleak the economy looks. But what should I do when the future looks bleak? Number one, I need to admit, I need to admit my fears to God. When the future looks bleak, I need to admit my fears to God. Number two, I need to focus on God. Who is he to me? What does he say he will do in his word? Think of all the precious promises that he gives me, he gives you as his children. I need to focus on God. Number three, I need, I need to make God the source of my joy. I need to take my eyes off of my money the stock market, the things that I have, my toys, um, the, the things that make me happy. I need to make God the source of my joy. And number four, I need to seek strength from God when my future looks bleak. As Isaiah said, you know, who told God what to do? Who told God how to create the earth? It says there that there isn't enough cattle in Lebanon to justify making sacrifices to him. 
because he's that great. He created the earth by speaking. He hung the stars in heaven by doing that. Scripture says he has them all named and numbered. And so I need to seek strength from God when my future looks bleak. Think about the great strength that he has. As this virus goes through the communities, do you think it's more than God can handle? So there's four ways in which I need to respond when the future looks bleak. I need to admit my fears. I need to focus on God. I need to make Him the source of my joy. And I need to find strength in Him. Father, let's pray. As we come into your presence this morning, we thank and praise you for what you blessed us with, Lord. As we think about this passage of Scripture when you told Habakkuk that Judah was going to be taken into captivity. And uh, Habakkuk said, I'm afraid. And yet, even though I'm afraid, I will trust in you, and I'll praise you, and I'll make my joy you. And so, Father, we pray that as we think about how he responded, we pray that our response also could be the same way, knowing that you, the sovereign God, who knows everything, is in control. And Lord, as we think about that passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 26, it really puts things in perspective. You don't need counsel from us. You don't need anything from us. And yet you desire us to love you, to follow you, to serve you, to praise you and worship you. And Father, in doing this, we pray that we would be able to follow what it talks about in First John, to love one another. In fact, if we went back to John, um, St. John, it reminds us, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Lord, we pray that as children of God, we would have love for each other, that we would uh, take care of each other as families. And yet, Lord, we pray that we could have the same outlook that Habakkuk had, Lord, that we could look to you for help and our strength, um, that we could admit our fears, that we could focus upon you, that we could make you our source of joy, and that we would sink strength from you. And so, Father, we pray that this would be our prayer to you. And we thank and praise you for how you're going to use us. In your name we pray.